Okay, now we're going to talk a bit about um, propositional functions. Uh, what we'll base this upon is this idea of interacting on the uh, couple of propositions and kind of st let's start off with one basic idea where we could say things like, uh, let's say we start off with the following proposition, which is a mark is oh, say six feet two inches tall. And so if we would have something like that, you know, this is either going to be true or false. It's, this is the idea of it's just simply a proposition. But there's two other propositions that we tend to say a lot of. If we would say consider um, the people in a room, we might be able to state two particular propositions that might be interesting, which would be things like everyone is, when I mean everyone, I mean people in a room, is six feet two inches tall. Or maybe I could say someone is six feet two inches tall. And in particular, this is what I'm saying, everyone or someone. This every and this sum is coming out of this group that I'm considering, like uh, people in a room, right? So I have this collection that I'm taking from for objects. And what this really gets down to is when I normally look at a proposition, it usually has some sort of idea of an object that we're considering has a, a predicate that we can test out. So for example, what we did is, you know, so Mark is our object, is six feet two inches tall. On the other hand, would be the predicate that I would actually be testing out. And so all these propositions have an object and a particular test. Well, then I could look at this and I could say, well, I have everyone, I have someone. And so predicates themselves, and one of the reasons why we name things across like what we're actually testing, is this true, yes or no? And it cannot be both. So predicates themselves are just the feature that I'm looking at. And so I noticed that I could put different objects in. I could say Mark is six feet tall. I could go ahead and plug in, say John is six feet tall. Or I could say Jane is six feet two inches tall. or And so I could have a lot of different objects that are fitting into this. So that gives me kind of a, a property of this acts. Stuff comes in and a true or false comes out. If Mark went in, it's gonna be true or false. If Jane goes in, it's gonna be true or false. And that acts like a function. So we'll go ahead and introduce that. A propositional function is just going to be, say, p of x is our notation for it, and it's going to be simply x has the predicate. And normally the predicate will be labeled as this same title here, the predicate p. So we get the example now would say blue of x denotes x is blue. Now, like all functions, Functions have these, these two parts. Uh, functions take one set, which we normally call the domain, and we have an object that's inside of our domain. The function itself will map it out to an object on this side, which is out of the codomain. Right? And normally on this side we would call this, so if my function is named p, the thing on this side would be you know p of x. And so for normal function notation, We have this idea of things from the domain go into the codomain. And so for propositional function, this left-hand side the domain is normally called the universe of discourse. It's the stuff you're talking about. It's like, what are you talking about? What's your discourse over? Like, if it's birds, if it's things that can be blue or whatever. And the codomain is a codomain, but for propositional functions, this is just simply true or false. That's all that ever comes out. 
So it takes an object, it maps it through it, and it spits out true or it spits out false. That's the only two things that ever exist in the codomain. Now, for a universe of discourse, which is the objects that go into your function, right? It's the domain. There's two ways of handling it. The first way is what's called, say, the natural domain or the natural universe of discourse. And this would be, I don't tell you what the objects are, but you pick up what they are by what makes sense. And so an example would be something like, let's go here, go back to, say, the blue function, which is blue of x. Oh, I use x too much. The blue of things is equal to that thing is blue. And I don't tell you, and the problem doesn't give the universe of discourse. So my question is, what, what do you think it would be? What is, so what do you think? the universe of discourse is. And so that's the idea of a natural domain. What, what seems to make sense? Well, you know, maybe the universe of discourse is, for example, equal to anything that can have an emotion. Well, why would I do that? Well, what if I noticed that this idea of blue is not a color, but being sad, right? Because I'm saying that blue is supposed to mean sad, right? It's like, oh, Mark is blue, he's sad, right? So maybe it's anything that can be an emotion, or maybe the universe of discourse is anything that has a color. Right. And so if I haven't stated it, it, it needs to be taken from context. So the idea of the natural domain is from context, what do you think we're talking about? So if I had an example of a, of a sentence that says, all ravens are black, you would say, well, maybe the stuff we're talking about is ravens, or maybe the stuff we're talking about is birds, because I'm you know, for all things birds, if it's a raven, then it's black. Maybe I'm going to talk about all other things. And maybe the universe of discourse is just simply the entire known universe of things. So the natural domain is what do you think makes sense for the objects that we're actually talking about? That's, that's the universe of discourse that, you know, works. Uh, when in doubt, make the dis universe of discourse tight. Don't just simply make it any possible thing. So if we're talking about blue, don't talk about, say, functions. Don't talk about the set of, of uh, oh, I don't know, dogs. <laughs> you know, it's like not all dogs are blue. Ah, this makes sense. It's like, yeah, okay. So pick things that make sense. On the other hand, instead of a natural da domain, we could just simply have a stated domain. So we could have, for example, a propositional function of, say, gt of x to denote, oops, supposed to be, denote x is strictly greater than 3, right? So if I look at this and I say, well, maybe, so what we would say is, okay, the universe of discourse for x is all, it could be all real numbers, it could be all things. It's like, no, I just want to talk about all integers. So I'm going to restrict myself to integers, and this is stated as part of the problem. So you just state the domain in your problem. And normally when you're creating problems, when in doubt, if you believe your readers could not figure out the natural domain that makes sense, the normal universe of discourse, state it, right? Just fl flat out talk about it. If you want to talk about real numbers, say you're using the reals. If you want to talk about rationals, say that you're using the rationals, right? So when you're doing these things, you just simply have to state them out as you go through these problems. So, so for predicates, we have this idea. Now, one of the things about the predicates themselves and the propositional functions, we can actually have n-ary propositional 
functions. And so what they're working on is not like a single object. We could have, say, P of x1, x2, up to xn denotes that the ordered tuple x1, x2, up to xn have predicate whatever you're talking about. So for example, we could have P of x, y, z denotes that x squared plus y squared is equal to z squared. And so now what I'm looking for is the things that make this true would be like the ordered the Pythagorean triples. So for example, P of 3, 4, 5 is true. But P of 1, 1, 1 is false. Right, so we can actually plug things in because 3 squared plus 4 squared is 5 squared, but 1 squared plus 1 squared is not 1 squared. Right, so we can go through problems of this nature and then, you know, go through it. We can specify propositional functions of one object or propositional functions of many objects. The important part here when we're talking about functions is that these symbols, this is not literally an X, right? Functional symbols are a concept of replacement. Whatever goes into this position must go into this position. Whatever goes into this position must go into this position. So when we're talking about this, these x, y's and z's are not x, y and z's. They're positional in nature. It's this idea of what goes here goes here. What goes here goes here. This is a machine. Things drop in, stuff drops out. 3, 4, 5 dropped in to 3, 4, 5 and out popped true, right? That's what happens for functions. And so the predicate is just the thing that is going to make it true or false. And the objects coming in is coming from the universe of discourse. So the next part here is like here is one way I turned this propositional function into a proposition by plugging things into it and it spit out a true and spit out a false. So the next thing we'll want to talk about is are there what are all the possible ways of taking a propositional function which isn't a proposition and turning it into a proposition. In other words something that actually is true or actually is false.